All right, hi everyone. We're gonna get started on the third and final seminar, which was on neuroscience. Um, and so I'm gonna get the uh, broadcasting started soon, uh, but I wanna introduce our speakers who are going to be uh, Matt Lambon ralph and Jeffrey Wamis, and our uh, seminar is gonna be chaired by Wilma Bainbridge. <clears throat> oh, we are on the next one. It might be easy to... Thanks, Wilma, for the introduction. Um, so I have had Dali to take care of my title slide for me in the wake of the workshops earlier in this week. Um, interesting that it just put a brain in there, even though the title doesn't contain anything about neuroscience. Um, and also, I'm in the neuroscience session, but COVID and Canada, that combination made it a little hard to do any sort of new fMRI research. So I'm going to be presenting some of the stuff that I worked on with Judy as the lead, looking at how uh, drawing uh, makes your underlying neural representations of concepts more distinct from one another. Um, but before I get into that, I'm going to talk about some of the behavioral work I've done and how drawing improves memory. And after that, if I haven't gone over my limit yet, I'll present some preliminary data from some pilot work I've been doing with the help of a couple undergrads actually who are starting as masters soon, soon. So we can get started. Okay, um, so there's a lot of kind of folk intuition about drawing being a useful tool for improving learning, memory, communication, all of those sorts of things. And of, of course, this has been backed by research as well, uh, perhaps most prominently for a while in the educational domain where you can have people create these visual representations of science concepts. Um, I won't get into it in too much detail because Logan did a really nice job a, a couple of workshops ago. Um, but basically often these manipulations provide students with a lot of kind of scaffolding instruction about how to draw. Um, and in some cases find benefits to learning, but not in other cases. And so what I was interested in when I started out on this work is, is whether drawing improves memory for simpler items and without any sort of scaffolding or additional assistance. So I took this down to the most basic level, have people do a simple task where we give them a cue and then a word, and then they do the task we cued them to do with the word that we cued them to do it with. So in this case, you draw a lion, and here I have two examples of people's drawings that they've created um, to varying degrees of success. So you can kind of pick out where on the spectrum between the left image and the right image your abilities might fall. And I can show you where mine fall later in the, in the talk. Um, so here's a bunch of examples of drawings that people have created. Um, this one here looks like it has a mullet. There's a lot of great examples that you can pick out. Um, but anyways, what turns out is that people's memory improves dramatically as a result of drawing. We compare that to various different baselines First one we used was just writing out the word, but we also compared it to several other baseline conditions that we thought captured some of the aspects of the drawing process. And um, things like visualizing the, your internal concept of a lion don't improve memory quite as much as drawing, neither does viewing a lion or listing its physical characteristics. So it seems like there's something special about drawing that's improving memory performance. This is in free recall, but we've done it in several other tasks as well. So having established this, um, we wanted to kind of probe deeper what possible mechanism could be driving this. And so unlike some of the earlier workshops, which broke drawings down into the component parts of the drawings themselves, we tried to break the process of drawing down into the things that are required to make it happen. So when you see a word, what do you have to do to make a drawing? Um, so you might break it down, or we broke it down into three pieces. So you have to think about what your internal representation of a line looks like, some, sort of, uh, some form of elaborative thinking. Then you have to actually put the pen to page and use your motor system to generate the strokes. And then you're left with this visual representation. So those are at least kind of three components of the drawing process. And what we toyed with was trying to take those away from our participants one at a time and see whether that impacted the benefits that were afforded to memory. And so one example here is the blind drawing condition. Can people see my cursor? I'll see if there's some nods, awesome. Um, so here people can actually see the strokes that they were creating. This is just a rendering of the coordinates that we picked up. 
So we're taking away that, vis that direct visual input, but leaving behind the kind of elaborative process of generating what you want to draw and the motor process of creating the strokes. Obviously, there's more differences than that, but um, that's the sort of game we are playing in this experiment. And what we find is that as we take these components away from people, you get this kind of stepwise function where memory decreases um, as you take more of those components away. So example here in the imagine condition, you don't really have a visual input and you don't really create any uh, kind of motor path. Um, we did some modeling, determined that the, the more active components seem to be the ones that are most driving the memory benefit. And had I been able to scan for the last year or two, I probably would have put this task or something like it in the scanner. So maybe at the workshop we do with the same crew in a few years, I'll be able to show you those data. Okay, so that was the major mechanism that we invested our time in, but through a series of experiments uh, from my group, but also from others in the field, some of which are here, um, we found that drawing benefits memory, this is, just data from some of our studies across several tasks and encoding durations. It improves memory disproportionately in older adults, uh, both normal healthy aging and people with probable dementia. It informs conceptual knowledge, seems to be effective across stimuli, outperforms several other tasks, some of which I've shown you. Um, it seems to be effective in some designs, but not others. Specifically, drawing can disrupt the sort of inter-item relational information that you get when people are doing list learning. Um, it leads to highly specific, richly contextual memories. And I think it's driven by at least three components, the elaborative kind of motoric and pictorial that I discussed earlier. Okay. So another mechanism that the drawing seems to impose on our, our representational systems it's been highlighted nicely by some previous work from Judy, um, which suggests that drawing um, highly similar objects can lead them to differentiate from one another. And so, uh, as I'm sure some of you are familiar, what, what Judy did was take these sets of four highly similar objects. Um, and before and after repeated drawing training, participants were given these kind of morphs between two endpoints. So between a bed and a chair, you have these kind of bed-like chairs and chair-like beds. And people have to decide whether they're a bed or a chair. After they do that a bunch of times, you can plot a logistic function that shows kind of where their decision boundary is. And then if you have them repeatedly draw the two objects, this decision boundary gets sharper, okay? So they're better able to distinguish between these two categories. And that was behavioral data and looking at uh, the drawings themselves. Uh, so Judy wanted to scan this and determine whether something similar happens in the brain. So whether you get representational differentiation as a function of this repeated drawing. Um, and I was fortunate enough to be part of this project. And, and so I'm gonna walk you through uh, the part that was, I guess, most related to my research program. Um, which was looking at whether uh, patterns of connectivity in the brain become more distinctive as a result of experience with drawing these concepts. Okay, so the idea is we have this, this concept of a bed and a chair. Do they become more distinct from one another with training? Okay, so we scanned people uh, while they were drawing. Um, and uh, what we did first was carve the brain up a little bit. So we selected only the swaths of cortex that were preferentially active when people were drawing relative to perception and rest. And we carved those up into uh, uh, ROIs that, that are probably implicated in the drawing process. So early visual cortical regions like V1, V2, LO, and then dorsal stream regions like parietal cortex and precentral gyrus and motor cortex. And we applied a novel method to these data. So, what we did essentially was take one voxel from early visual cortex, and then we can look at the time course of activation as someone's drawing a bed, for example, okay? So that's all the time points while they're creating that drawing. Take another voxel from parietal cortex, get that same time course of activation, and then we can find the correlation between those two things to get an estimate of their functional connectivity. 
And we don't just do that for one pair of voxels. We do it for every possible combination of voxels between those two regions of interest. And what this gives us is basically a template for the pattern of connectivity between those regions during that trial, okay? So we get one of these for every trial. So people are alternating between drawing a chair and a bed. And we can train a classifier to distinguish whether each one of these templates is from a trial that was drawing a bed or a chair, okay? So we have these templates. This one's characteristic of bed, this one chair. We get a new trial that's been held out from the model. And we can determine the extent to which that template is more like a bed or more like a chair, okay? And so the idea is if these patterns are becoming more distinctive, the accuracy of the classification should get better from early to late in the task. And so these red arrows here are representing our estimate of that measure. So that's the extent to which these concepts and their underlying representations seem to be differentiating as a result of training. And uh, just to highlight our example here, what we find is that this increase in selectivity happens in V1 and parietal cortex, but also in several other pairs of regions. Um, most prominently, it's kind of connectivity within early visual cortex, but we also get these kind of bridge ROI pairs that go between V1 and parietal cortex and V2 and parietal cortex, okay? So this is some interesting evidence that we're getting more differentiated patterns of connectivity as a result of this training. Um, and what we think this might reflect is that there's some enhanced transmission of object-specific information um, along the dorsal stream. So basically between these early visual regions and uh, more motor planning regions. All right. <clears throat> so moving on to some very preliminary data. Um, essentially what seems to have happened in the neuroimaging study that I just showed is that you have these two representations that are differentiating over time as a result of experience. And it seems like what, what's happening here is that in the space of possible bed drawings or chair drawings, these are kind of moving to be more distinct from the other concepts. So more kind of in the crescent of these uh, possible representational spaces. So with some students, uh, what we were trying to do is figure out whether there were other ways to push people into the crescents. And also because distinctiveness is something that's known to improve memory, could this be one of the active ingredients that's leading us to get such consistent benefits across all of these experiments? And so we leveraged a few available tools. So the, the first thing that we did was train a convolutional neural network um, to recognize even my terrible drawings. So I promised we'd get back to some of mine and these are them. Um, so it's doing okay, except for it thinks my rake is a paintbrush or asparagus, but otherwise we're doing okay. Um, so we trained these neural networks so that we'd be able to identify the extent to which we're able to classify the object. And then we also made use of sketch RNN. And um, for those not familiar, it's, it's where you can create a stroke and then the model will kind of finish a drawing of the concept for you. Uh, Judy's group took this a step further and made it so that you could alternate strokes with the model. Um, and what my students thought would be interesting is if we could kind of use that technique to nudge the participants' drawings toward a particular part of the representational space. Um, ideally, away from the kind of center of an object's possible drawings and towards those kind of more distinct or unique drawings. Um, and so these are the two students. One of them is a master's student in my lab now. And so if we look, if we look at the space of possible drawings, this is my lobster. Similar to that are a lot of other lobster drawings um, that I also did a few days ago for this talk. Um, now you have a concept that's a crab. It's probably pretty close to the lobster. And then this crab is a bit more lobster-like than the rest. So it's probably closer to the overlap. And then we have other concepts that are probably completely non-overlapping like basket here, for instance. And so what they thought was, we can have a few different conditions. 
the same condition is exactly the way that Judy had set it up. You alternate strokes with the model. You're both trying to draw a lobster. That probably situates you nicely in the center of possible lobster drawings. We have a similar condition where you're trying to draw a lobster, but the model's drawing a crab. And the idea here is maybe this is gonna nudge your drawing away from the kind of center of the lobster distribution, right? It's gonna get you something a little more distinct. And then the different condition nudges you towards something completely incoherent, like basket in this case, right? So you're gonna end up probably somewhere in no man's land where the, the drawing isn't gonna be of anything that anyone would recognize, right? If we take those away, what this yields is that the similar condition will hopefully give us the most memorable representation of the object. Um, and, and that was kind of the prediction that we were testing. So first we'll look at the manipulation. We see that the evidence for the target category is highest in the same condition and then tapers off. If we look at the evidence for the nearest competitor, it's highest in the similar condition where that's what the model is trying to draw. And the different object doesn't come up at all except for in the different condition. And you can see how all these bars are lower. So essentially this is producing an incoherent drawing. This is producing something that's nicely balanced between the two. And this is totally dominated by the target. Not all that surprising. That's kind of what we design things to do. But the critical bit here is zooming in on the similar condition and trying to see what happens when items are recalled versus forgotten. So in the forgotten items, we get this case where you still have substantially more target evidence uh, than near evidence, right? So there's still a huge divide between these two things. So what we think might be happening there is that we're nudging them towards the crab risk uh, distribution, but they're not going far enough. So they're still landing somewhere in the middle and it's not all that memorable. Um, and then in the recall condition, we get this interaction where there's a much nicer balance between the two concepts. So maybe that's pushing them more towards the periphery and that's what's leading to improved memory performance. Now, I mentioned this is preliminary data. So those explanations are also quite preliminary. We're doing follow-up studies to look at the kind of feature distributions, what else might predict memory, different items, things of that sort. Um, so, with the help of these undergrads, I think what we showed is that collaborative drawing um, works, even if you have the, the agent draw something that's like covertly kind of competing against you, and it behaves in expected ways. Um, and if the manipulation successfully nudges drawings sufficiently, then recall is significantly improved, although there's still several sticks we have to poke that with to make sure that it holds up. Um, so thank you so much for your attention. Thank everyone who's involved with all of this work and the people that were kind enough to give me money to do it. Um, so I'm ready for questions. Yeah. Fantastic talk. So I'll wait a few moments for to see if anyone in the audience has questions, if you want to use a raise hand feature. Okay. While people are thinking of questions, then I'll ask a question. So I'm curious, um, looking back at your fMRI results, which is the chicken and which is the egg? So do you think it's that um, you have these more distinct cons like cognitive and maybe thus neural representations that then drive the drawings apart? Or is it that your drawings become more visually dissimilar from each other and then that causes the V1 mm -hmm. representations to become pulled apart? Or like early uh, visual cortex, yeah. Yeah, that's a great question and, and a, a hard one to answer, I guess. Um, so, we could look at that. I think we have the drawings over time. We could look at whether they start differentiating from one another before it happens in the brain. But if I had to give you sort of a, a hand wavy guess, I imagine that they're kind of feeding back to one another. So your drawing changes slightly. Now what you're perceiving is changing slightly and how you're using that to generate the next drawing is changing as well. Um, so that would be my guess is that it's kind of like, those two things are reciprocally influencing one another. Um, yeah. Yeah, it probably is this sort of like cycle. Yeah, chicken and egg cycle. Yeah, yeah, I would think so. But yeah, it's it's hard to tease apart which one precedes the other because I think they're both kind of dynamic processes that are unfolding over time. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, any questions from our audience?
Oh, I see we have a question in the chat. So Elian asks, for the first part of the presentation, how did you control for how much time they spent with the items when drawing versus the other conditions? Yeah, this, this is always tricky. So I, I guess I didn't have time to get into the specifics, but in the right condition, we had them repeat writing multiple times for the same duration. Um, in other conditions like trace and blind drawing, it was easier to match the time. And so we've, we've done things like that where we just have them fill the entire time spent writing to match the time spent drawing. But we've, we've also done things like dramatically shorten the time available for them to draw. So it's maybe like only three seconds. And then it's a lot easier to match the other conditions. And we actually seem to get a much stronger benefit in those cases. Um, and I also have some work with uh, Brady Roberts, actually, who's, who's here. Um, showing that even if you kind of prohibit them from starting drawing, even just the process of engaging that internal representation and thinking about what you plan to draw is enough to improve memory. Um, so that's a roundabout answer that ended in a tangent, but uh, the answer, I guess, is two different ways. We reduce the time so that it makes more sense for the right condition, and we repeat the right condition so it fills the time that's more extended for drawing. That's great. You tested it both ways. Yeah, and Aline, thank you for your explanation. Yeah, so we have a question from Tim. Yeah, thanks so much for that interesting talk, Jeff. Um, I was just curious about, it was uh, surprising, I guess, a bit to me that you were looking in the neural data at sort of visual and dorsal stream activation. I guess mm -hmm. I might have expected to see some of those effects in the ventral visual processing stream. And I was wondering whether, uh, you know, you were focusing on the dorsal stream because of the, the action component uh, or whether you actually didn't really see drawing related activity in the ventral stream. Right. So there's a whole other piece of that paper that I didn't get a chance to go into where we were trying to train classifiers on activity while people were perceiving uh, the objects and then tested on periods of time when they were drawing. And there we get reasonable decoding. But there still, it's mostly in V1, V2, and LO, although we do get a bit more down the ventral stream. Um, we actually, interestingly, didn't find any evidence for differentiation in individual ROIs um, as a result of learning. Well, so that's where we kind of turned to these more exploratory analyses, taking into account that this is a dynamic process that requires you to kind of share information between the visual motor regions. Um, so. Yeah, we didn't find much in the way of, of consistent representation um, outside of those mostly early visual cortical regions, nor did we find evidence for differentiation. So it was primarily that sharing of information. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question. So